by me. We're rolling! Hey, Mark. Action! Snake Plissken is back in John Carpenter's Escape from L.A. 15 years after they made the classic Escape from New York, Carpenter and Kurt Russell have reunited to bring Snake into the 21st century. This is Kurt's idea of an outrageous action hero. Look in my face when I talk to you. He has an ultimate hatred of authority that uh, is comical somehow. Black box is a matter of national security. What's it do? Top secret. Only on a need to know. Evidently, I don't need to know, so fuck you. I'm going to Hollywood. Snake's such a great character because he's so cool. I just get a kick out of Snake. Catches on quick, doesn't she? It's one of the most amazing, visually stunning pictures I've ever seen. I mean, it's really just stunt-filled, action-filled. Part of the fun of this movie is that you find Snake Plissken in a situation where he's got to surf his way out of it. <laughs> it's the biggest kick-ass movie I've ever done. very dark view of the near future. So it wasn't a science fiction film that took place on another planet or in a spaceship or anything like that. It dealt really with things that you could see, like street gangs and buildings and darkness. I wrote it right out of film school in 1974. And it wasn't made till 81 because it was deemed to be too dark and we treated the president with not enough respect. I think I wrote the movie originally for Charles Bronson or Clint Eastwood. And here comes Kurt Russell, who's a really, really great actor. This guy can act in anything. He can act any part. So off we went on uh, Escape, and it's one of my favorite films. It was done with the kind of sense of humor that we knew if the audience took it right, that they could have a great time with. I'm not a fool, Bliskin. Call me Snake. That looks like Snake Bliskin. I hear you slow down. You didn't look that slow, Clarabelle. Kurt Russell and I had been talking about doing a sequel to this movie since about 1985. We were on an airplane coming back from New York, and we said, wouldn't it be great to go back and revisit it? And the gloom and doom and horror of New York that was going on when I wrote the original script basically has kind of moved out here to the West Coast. We'd had earthquakes, riots, mudslides, and fires in Los Angeles and figured, you know, well, now we have a story. In a period there of about two years, it seemed to all go at once. And the city all of a sudden became just a great place to escape from. You can't just be walking around town without knowing the ropes. You take the wrong street, you're dead, pal. Cut! Good. Let's see one more rehearsal, please. Here we go. I worked with John certainly more than anybody else in my life. We've now made five movies together, and I find him to have a great dry sense of humor, uh, an ultimate hatred of authority <laughs> that is comical somehow, and a strange way of looking at the world. Okay, one more time. Here we go. I like that part of John. See, that's, that's fantastic. Can we handle that? Sure. Great. There's a part of John that's Snake Plissken. It's that sort of anti-establishment. Um, and cut. Oh, yeah, mama. Yeah. Personally, I kind of share this uh, disdain for authority that Pliskin has. It's kind of adolescent, the kind of stuck in adolescence attitude. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I enjoy that. It doesn't get me very far in life, but I still kind of hold it dear to my heart. And Kutsky, all right. <laughs> Kutsky, you're doing we share a lot in common about drama and timing and so forth. And we have a lot of respect for each other's job. And one of the reasons Kurt wanted to do this and got me back into it was, let's have some fun again. Let's have a blast. And he was right. It was an absolute blast to do it. It's just an aftershock. No big deal. We get them all the time. Part of the fun of this movie is that we wanted to take this guy into a world that had changed. So we assume that uh, in the year 1999, there's a gigantic earthquake that separates Los Angeles from the mainland. So it's now an island. 
and some of the areas of town are still somewhat intact and some are wasteland. So Los Angeles is the deportation island for all the morally guilty people. That would include runaways, pornographers, drug dealers. Um, I'd probably be sent there myself, as a matter of fact. You may have escaped from New York, but this is LA, brother. And this city can kill anybody! Cuervo Jones is a South American revolutionary. He runs with a paramilitary revolutionary group called Shining Path. And their goal is to take back um, North America. Are you ready for the new world? But Snake Plissken, once again, is brought into duty by the United States Police Force. And he has to kind of run a gauntlet to get this doomsday device from Corvo Jones, which has the possibility of basically turning out the lights on the world, plunging it into the dark ages. Sad story. You gotta smoke. Explain to this foot soldier why he's going to do what we tell him to do. What's he talking about? The Plutoxin 7 virus. He's a wanted man, and they force him to go on this mission by injecting him with a deadly virus that will kill him within 10 hours. Of course, there is an antidote. Which I will personally authorize once your mission is completed. And that's kind of the, the modus operandi of the snake character. You have to force him to do something. He won't do it for a cause. You have to say, you have no choice, pal. You're going to die. I think the main reason that the first movie's popularity has remained is the main character. He's the baddest guy in the bad world. He is legendary in his meanness and in his toughness to the world. Nobody draws until this hits the ground. Draw. Just left you wondering what, what, what made that guy so mean and so contrary to everything, everybody. Thanks for not killing me, man. I owe you one. The great thing I think that's fun to do with this character is we humiliate Snake. Funny, though. I thought you'd be taller. Just sort of brushes it off. It's a part of life and moves on. <laughs> We're holograms, Pliskin. John and I have always gotten a kick out of, uh, well, well, what if we did this with Snake? And then we look at each other and say, man, that's, that's really funny, but the, I mean, it really makes him look bad. And we go, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> by the way, who gives me the antidote? The medical team will be standing by. Neither one of you? No. Good. Bye-bye, <laughs> Snake. Good luck. Oh, shit. I'm always worried whenever we're doing any stunts, and particularly when you have an actor like Kurt Russell who likes to do his own stunt work. Oh, Bang. Bang. Oh. Jeff Amato, who was our stunt coordinator, and John Carpenter worked very closely on the set together and developed some remarkable action-filled scenes for Kurt Russell. quite difficult keeping him off the motorcycle. In this sequence, Snake Plissken sees a caravan going by with Burbo Jones, who has a black box. So Snake proceeds to eliminate 19 guys from the back forward. I'm just going straight out. I hit an even speed. I'll stay there. Okay, you take your own timing. When it hits me, I'll let it go. Right on. All right. I think part of the fun of this movie is the different kinds of action. Dude, is that you, Snake? The tsunami sequence with Peter Fonda. It's going to be a blast to watch. Whoa. What is that? Tsunami, Snake. Tsunami, woo! I wrote this scene where Pliskin and this old surfer surf down Wilshire Canyon. And it's one of those scenes where you read it, 
And you say, well, there's no way we can do this. <laughs> and this is gonna be some kind of bitch ride. Let's go, come on. Woo! Peter can tell you all about it. Peter, Peter's the expert. He's a surfer, you know, he knows all about it. He knows how to ride a tsunami. Here's the secret. As told to Snake Plissken by Pipeline. Let the front edge pick you up. Don't get on your board till you ride to the top. And don't blow it, man. If you fall off the board, it's the big white eye. Finished. Got it? Woo! Bitchin'. Sure enough, somewhere in your life, there, there comes a time when a tsunami is on the way. You've been shot in the leg. You're in Wilshire Canyon, and there's no way out other than to surf out of it. Hang on, Snake. Ah! If you can imagine the force of any tidal wave, we've managed to put together some great effects on it. And uh, it's just fantastic. Later. One of the ways that we approached what Los Angeles would look like is that we sort of said, okay, if there was an earthquake of this size, what would be left? There would certainly be some areas that would exist. There would be other areas that would be reduced to total rubble. Creating the earthquake was hard because we have crashes. We built the Bonaventure Hotel and we're crashing that. We have the spectacular tsunami. The freeway overpass collapse is actually one of those four changes, and so it's sort of stacked up. John wanted the four-level interchange to collapse, so the only way to do that is to build it and build it big. This thing is capable of shaking, moving up and down, getting a big shock wave moving through it. All the columns have breaking points inside, which when we shoot the final collapse, they'll mushroom out. This whole thing basically will come down. All these cars that are going to be on the freeway are all radio controlled, so we can drive them in, we can smash them to the railings, we can have them get into wrecks with each other. We'll have a giant tractor trailer come through the second level at camera. When we roll cameras, we're going to do it, because once we're committed, we're committed. Roll cameras, clear! Action! on Sunset Boulevard, uh, circa 2013. After a major, major earthquake, what I tried to do is build up a very textured, layered look. We've literally moved 29 tons of concrete rubble, and we've dressed all the streets with just massive concrete pieces. There's a whole different kind of energy that takes place when you do this type of set. That set was interesting because scientists like to say this couldn't happen, this couldn't happen in Los Angeles, even if there was a bigger thing. Well, if you've seen any of those pictures of China, then you know that that's what Sunset Boulevard could very well look like if there was a really big earthquake. Oh, don't shoot. Well, I've been hanging out around here for more years than I want to think about, but I never thought I'd see Snake Bliskin cruising Sunset Boulevard. I'm after the stars, Eddie. We tried to think of a character who would be indigenous to L.A., and it's mapped to the stars Eddie as a kind of a sleazebag talent agent who sells maps. Welcome to your very own Map to the Stars. It's me. And then runs around making deals and sells everyone out. He's a very familiar character to anyone who's worked in Hollywood. Yeah, she's going to love you, Snake. You're going to love her, too. We're going to make this thing happen. Oh, by the way, I'm through with Cuervo. Guy's got no sense of loyalty whatsoever. He's on any side that will benefit him. Oh, Cuervo. It's so good to see you. He's a survivor. He's a go-getter. He's a do-gooder and a bedwetter. He's just a funny guy. When John and I and Kurt were approaching the casting of the movie, what we wanted to do was cast around Snake Plissken some really interesting personas. So we decided that what we might do is to go sort of retro casting. So Cliff Robertson plays the President of the United States. I've got to go to my quarters. I've got to pray! Stacy Keach plays Cliff Robertson's right-hand man, Malloy. The United States is the no-smoking nation. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs, no women. Valeria Golina plays Tazalima. If you want to make noise, go and find another bush. And Cuervo Jones is played by George Corfach. Bend over, Mr. President. Time for a spanking. He's a trained revolutionary. He's after power. He's after control. And he's very smart. 
Not as smart as Snake Plissken, but almost. <laughs> now is the time to rise up and demand the surrender of the president. Utopia is the um, president's daughter, and she's rebelling against her father, who's become like this dictator. And Cuervo Jones manipulates her and convinces her that she can help him save the world. So she does that. She hijacks a plane, takes off, and becomes Cuervo's queen. We're going to style our way back to glory! All I'd heard auditioning was innocent, young, you know, naive. <laughs> I did not see anything about lingerie. Deborah wrote this scene where Beverly Hills is inhabited by surgical failures who capture people who are live specimens, bring them in there, cut them up, and sew them on other bodies. We both dead meat. So to pull this off, I went to Rick Baker, who's the best special effects makeup guy in the world. The makeups are all kind of based on real plastic surgery and kind of techniques, only only done a, a little more crudely. We have a lot of, you know, cheekbone implants and, you know, too much collagen in the lips and just, you know, kind of poor taste plastic surgery is what we've done. It's pretty strange quarters inside there with some pretty strange looking people. It makes you wonder where cosmetic surgery might go. <laughs> we created the Surgeon General Beverly Hills and this is a guy who's always looking for plastic surgery parts. These are no good. I can't work with garbage like this. <laughs> this role needed somebody to play it in a real way and yet be completely tweaked. And Bruce Campbell can play tweaked like nobody's busy. What a beautiful blue eye. Shame he only has one. Nurse? Cut. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a couple of masks and looks in that scene that are obviously over the top. But in terms of Bruce, we wanted you to think, you know, I've seen people like this walking around the streets. The Surgeon General is a little bit of a cross between uh, Michael Jackson and Siegfried and Roy. You know, it's just kind of plastic surgery taken a little too far. <laughs> we have the slightly pointed nose of it's undergone a few too many shavings. The veneer teeth, a little too white and straight. And then uh, we've done the Kirk Douglas chin, because everyone would want a Kirk Douglas chin. And I wanted to give him bad hair plugs. We've got the little bit of the doll's head going here. People are a little embarrassed, though. They, they, they'll see me on the set and go, that's not your hair, is it? 86A, take one. <laughs> I want to cut him. Very nice. What did you think? <laughs> An escape from New York, Snake was taken at one point and thrown to the wolves, you know, to be the, the evening's entertainment. And uh, it was clubs with nails and trash can lids. Very, uh, oh, what's the word, the gladiatorial, you know. So in this one, uh, I came up with this little game that Cuervo likes to put his prisoners through. And uh, it came off of an idea that John had about a basketball 24 second shot clock. <laughs> If you didn't get the shot off before the buzzer went, you got shot. It was sort of a Millennium Gladiator sequence. And we thought about going to the Forum, we thought about going to all these basketball places, and then it occurred to me that the greatest place to be the L.A. Coliseum is it's such a huge area. And what you could do with an empty Coliseum would be a really kind of moody thing. This is insane. It is. That's the point. Game time! <laughs> so we bring Snake into that. I guess the hope there was to let the audience sort of think, okay, what are they going to do this time? All you're going to do is make ten points. By the way, nobody's ever walked off that court alive. Nobody. Got it. Both John Carpenter and Kurt Russell wanted the character Snake Plissken to actually make the basket rather than through Hollywood magic. We wanted to get me making the baskets. We wanted to get me in the same shot as the ball going in the hoop. And we wanted to do as many in a row as we could. 
So we set up a basketball hoop for Kurt so that the 50-so nights of shooting that we did before we got to the Coliseum, he could rehearse every night, and he got to be a pretty good ball player. <laughs> That's the one. You got it on film, didn't you? Yeah, it's there forever. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Print it. <laughs> the problem here is that I can't wear my glasses, and I have to have the eye patch on. <laughs> See this here? Black. Watch. Follow the ball to the hoop. He's been hitting them. With yeah, it's that eye patch. It's the eye patch. It was pretty hard because of the one eye. Uh, and also because if you're going to do it a lot of times, you're going to get tired. Okay. We'll just keep trying it over and over again. Here we go, guys and gals. Be camera marks. Be marked. And action. I guess I went up and down the court about 150 times during the night. I got pretty tired. Get into your It was kind of a night where I uh, began to feel my age a little. <laughs> the hardest thing about it, though, was having been an athlete and performed in front of people before you like to do well. Not fun to go out there in front of a lot of people and fail miserably um, and not be able to get the basket in the hoop. Very quickly on in the evening, bets were flowing, and uh, I won a lot of people some money, and I lost a lot of people some money. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, we made every basket there. There was a layup. There was a jump shot. There was a three-pointer. There was a mid-court shot. Then there's a full-court lob. But I don't think I'll give away how the scene ends. I don't think I should. I'm here, Buskin. Have you got the black box? I can get your precious little box back, but I'm going to need more time, you understand? You listen to me, Pliskin. That little headache that just kicked in will only get worse. You're starting to feel the effects of the virus. Now, you bear that in mind. Snake has a time clock to work against, if he wants to live. But he's a guy that can survive. So he, he, he will figure out a way. This is big. It's Snake Pliskin. I brought him here to see you, Hershey. What's in it for me? I know that voice. Your car, Jack Malone. Not anymore. Snake and Car Jack, we were buddies. And at the time when we were buddies, I was a man. And I'm no longer a man, and it surprised him. You look a little different in those days, Car Jack. You get one thing straight, Pliskin. I'm no longer Car Jack Malone. A Priscilla's promise, the most drop dead to die for number you ever laid that one eye on. I said to John, I said, why can't we just take a character that's a transsexual? And just make it a guy that Snake kind of likes. A guy, a guy, girl, he, she, which so that's for the, his, her, she is the name of the character. So John started laughing. He started liking the idea of this character. Why should we leave? I love L.A. Pam Greer did some really fun, very hip stuff, and, uh, and she's, uh, she's terrific. So how are we going to get out? I'll tell you that when we get there. Oh, Pliskin, man, you are such a loser, man, making up shit along the way. No deal. Government chopper. It'll be there. Okay, that's better. Hershey wants to kill Snake, but ends up helping Snake. The wind's up. Come on, let's go! We have a hang glider attack on the Happy Kingdom, and our heroes take off from the Queen Mary downtown. They fly through downtown Los Angeles and there's a giant attack on this amusement park. It's a battle sequence that uh, is certainly unparalleled in any movie that I've ever worked in. There's thousands of extras, hundreds of stunts, people flying in on hang gliders, fist fights happening. It's all at night, and it involves all sorts of stunts, all sorts of action. We've just had a blast doing it. Escape from L.A. is kind of a tour through L.A., through Snake Plissken's eyes. You're gonna see some pretty cool stuff. You gotta be kidding me. You've never seen anything like it. 
It is a great ride, and it is a great escape. I told you you'd better hope I didn't make it back. 